welcome to Tazia Learning the Language of Autism. Another chapter. So we are on still chapter three, food, but part B. Last week, for those of you who um, watched the video, will know that we just kind of like did a bit of a overall on the various senses and how that can trigger when food is around or talked about or consumed by some autistic people. So this week I'm going to be focusing on, my notes are here, we're going to be so focusing just on two, two or three things which is the sight of food and how that may manifest or cause some difficulties or some excitement and also the colour of food so that links in with this you know with with sight but specifically with color and also the sound of food um which is slightly more difficult to get your head around or even help your um autistic child adult to you know be able to explain what it is that's going on for them okay so um <clears throat> i shall put links on at the end of the video of this video of the previous one so any of you that have missed um, can you know just click on those videos and you can catch up um, or you can just look at the playlists and um, click on to the playlist and then you'll get a list of the four or five videos that I've already posted right so last week I touched on um, synthesia getting better at saying it now and because I feel when we're dealing with food when we're talking about food Synthesia is, you know, big in my mind and it feels like all the senses really do get an opportunity to just delve in and switch about and meld and do all sorts of weird and funky stuff. And um, I looked it up in uh, Wikipedia of what synthesia is and I've got my notes here so I shall read it to you. It says, it's a perceptual phenomenon in which stimulation of one sensory or cognitive pathway leads to automatic sensory, leads to automatic. So, automatically. So, in other words, sensory stimuli triggers a different kind of sensation. So, one sensory stimuli of colour may, in turn, um, trigger a smell. Or some people see let um, like the alphabet, and then they'll see the numbers underneath, or the colours of that sound. It's um, it's really, really cool. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, the explanation of it I just find fascinating. It just, just explains to me that, you know, our senses are so much more. We're so much more. Um, it seems to me that mostly neurotypical people, we skim our senses. We don't really often allow ourselves to fully engage in one sense. It's like, have you ever um, eaten, you know, taken an orange or an apple or something, anything, and, and sort of looks at it for ages and really soaked up how it looks and then put it in your mouth and not bite it, chew it or suck it, but just really, really kind of like absorb yourself into the sensation of, you know, the taste, just purely on the taste of your eyes closed and just really like feel the taste of that. And then it's, it is a really different experience. It's a much more intense experience. It says here that the earliest record of synthesia was in 1690 with John Locke, who's a philosopher and academic. Um, and he wrote a piece about a blind man who said that he could see the colour scarlet whenever he heard a trumpet. Now this guy had no vision, so as he's sitting there in the sort of darkness of his blindness, he could hear the sound of a trumpet and he saw the colour scarlet. Um, and so he started to see colours when he heard sounds, which is pretty cool. And then the first official medical account of that was from a guy called George... Um, Theos Ludwig Sachs in 1812 so it's a thing um, there's loads of stuff on YouTube I've already looked so if any of you are really interested in this synthesis or feel like it's something that 
could be in your life um, for you or with your autistic child, young adult, adult, <clears throat> then please do, you know, Google synthesia and there's loads of people talking about it on YouTube. Loads. It's a really fascinating subject. Okay, so the sight of food. So often before anyone's even mentioned, you've got to eat this or shall we eat this or it's dinner time, let's have this for breakfast. The, 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 even the mention of food can be enough to trigger all the things that we're going to be talking about today and next week regarding food and stuff we've already talked about previously. <clears throat> just hearing words of things can often just send an autistic person kind of like linking that word and to experiences that they've had to that word. So if they had a pleasant experience with regards to a certain word or something, then they can often feel at ease and excited and lovely. But if it wasn't such an, a nice experience for them, it could bring up all those anxieties, all those worries, all those fears, and could create, well, reproduce those behaviours that maybe they um, experienced previously, even though they're not actually experiencing that anymore. But just the thought or the reminder of that word or that experience can just trigger a whole memory of stuff. <clears throat> I mean, this is something that will thread through all of, you know, autism really, and a possibility anyway for some autistic people that if you mention words and you're suddenly in your mind be thinking, well, Everything was fine. I only said blah, 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 blah. And then, it, you know, it just caused this person to become very anxious or behave differently or whatever. It's often because of what I've just said. It's a memory that will just trigger off, a, you know, a reality to them of that moment. It's almost like re, re, rewinding it and playing it in your mind. But it's so real to that autistic person because everything you, they feel so deeply and so intensely that it feels real again <clears throat> so with the sight of food it's um literally the, the the sight of it so we're talking about the shape of food the color of food the texture of food you know how big the food is how small the food is how much food is on the plate how little food is on the plate detail is very important to a lot of autistic people, some are just, it's the whole picture. Um, and sometimes because they look at a whole picture and they absorb everything um, at once, you know, a plate of food with loads of stuff on it can just be sending so many different messages that they, they can't cope, so therefore they won't even touch the food in it, even if there's some food on that plate that they may well have eaten before. It's really important to try and kind of like separate and go minimal when starting to experiment um, with food with your autistic carey. So the sight of food um, can be really important and I've heard, you know, as I've been researching and experiencing with my own son and also spending most of my time <laughs> talking, listening, reading conversations um, with autistic people regarding all sorts of subjects, this is something that's come up quite a lot. Um, is the shape of food could be really, really important. So some people have said that they can only eat round food. Um, it just feels better to them to eat food that is shaped with soft edges. Um, and if that's the case and you know that, then you know you, you can have you can just create food, you can either make food uh, into round shapes. Well, there's plenty of food you can buy, there's plenty of veg, plenty of fruit that you can buy that's round. And you just just give them round food if that's what they like and if that's what makes them feel comfortable and that's what, you know, gets them to eat food that they enjoy with, with, with pleasure, then round food. So these are sorts of questions if your child is able to communicate with you and be able to express these sensory needs, because um, sometimes it can be really difficult to do that because they're so overwhelming. Um, particularly when children are a bit younger, often you'll say, well, just tell me what you want. Sometimes they can, but sometimes they can't tell you. And sometimes they'll be able to tell you if you've got pictures of, of colours and sounds and f visual, you know, feeling pictures of emotions and stuff. It, you know, it, it's worth doing investigative work, I'd say, 
um, you know, I've learned as I go stumbling, but I'm kind of like giving you all, those of you that are new to this um, a heads up to ask kinds of questions about the shape. Is, is it the shape of food that's important or is it the texture of food? Is it because of the colours? Tell me about the colours. Can you see the colours? You know, it, it's about getting you to kind of like think about food, not just as food, but as an actual energy and an object as well as that I really need my kid to eat because often as a parent we just get so focused on I just need my child to eat you know or my young person to eat otherwise I'm worried about their health that we forget about breaking it all down and looking at it from an autistic person's possible point of view so if you you know be mindful of that so you know you can even make little notes in your head every time you know I gave them round food they seem to eat it or every time I gave them you know spaghetti stringy food playful food food that they can kind of like flop about and play with and kind of like it might feel good um then you know you just spend time giving them that that kind of food you can shred vegetables carrots courgettes you can do all sorts of really funky stuff with food that's the amazing thing about food all we need to know is is like the clues and then you can run with whatever it is um square food it's just just think about the shape of food also, the size of food can be really important. Like if the food is just too big, and again, too big to you might not be too big to me. So again, it's about your child and what your child feels comfortable with putting in their mouth. And if something's too big, like my son, if he eats things, like we pretty much chop stuff up and there's a ritual to his eating. But if it's something that he puts in his mouth and it's too much because he just sometimes he just wants to eat and get it done even though he's enjoying it he can gag and it isn't because he doesn't like it or he doesn't want it it's just because he's just put too much in his mouth um, and that was something I had to teach him because he'd put take great big bitefuls with his enthusiasm and then of course he would just be <laughs> <laughs> So I like even teaching him to just, and that took quite a while, tiny bits, tiny bits, tiny bits, chew. <laughs> Sometimes he'd eat and swallow. <laughs> so it's like really breaking everything right down. Um, remember, you know, to a lot of autistic people, food and eating isn't an issue in any way, shape or form. And they will eat anything um, or they'll eat their certain foods, but they'll do it with, with ease and, you know, joy and no concern at all um and the same with like, same with everybody sometimes they just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat just want to keep on eating and that's another thing that we you know we can talk about later on down the road wet food and dry food is very important too um, it can make a huge difference as, as to whether that person can actually eat that food so it's an, that's another question to ask and by dry food i mean that's fairly obvious we know what dry food is so what I mean by dry food is literally no liquid on it in any way, shape or form. So that means gravy, sauce, um, juice, sort of, um, you know, soupy type meals, stews. Um, you know, what might be really yummy to us or to you or other members of your family just really may not be yummy to the autistic person because of the runny texture of it and, and if it is that then they're not going to eat it no matter what you do another thing that can come up a lot is um whether the food looks shiny or um matte it's like really it's like oh okay so if food is shiny i'm trying to think of a so like some fruit is shiny um, that can cause some problems to some autistic people that I've spoken to. Texture, so the texture of a, the look of a food can cause certain sensations in somebody's psyche, physicality, um, as well as like the texture once they put it in their mouth. But if they don't like the look of it because of the colour or the size or the texture, then they're not going to put it in their mouth. So all these questions are worth asking and if you can't ask the question because your child isn't yet ready to be able to process that question and understand it or whether your child just doesn't, can't explain it and figure it out for themselves because of their development stage, then you, 
it kind of makes it more difficult, obviously, but it also it just means you just got to look closer and just be patient with yourself and just go, you know, you will get this because you've got a vested interest in your child and you will figure it out. Um, yeah, so someone did say that why would they food that wasn't the same colour as their skin she was a um, Caucasian young lady and to her all food had to be beige or like yeah all, all beige white food and she just didn't understand why anyone thought it was okay to eat food that wasn't the same colour as her so there's just little things like that it's, you know it's, it's logical if you're coming at it from her perspective um, the texture of food can be really important and this is quite an interesting one because texture is really important often um, you know loads of parents have said it I've read and lo 